And welcome to Jay Moore's new JBiz Health Innovation Series, featuring accomplished leaders in healthcare who are developing and using innovative approaches in healthcare. I'm your host, Gary Stein. The JBiz Health Innovation Series is brought to you by Nemphos Brow, the Mid Atlantic's leading boutique corporate law firm supporting corporate growth at every stage of business. Nemphos Brow specializes in corporate business, startup, and entrepreneurial law. Their team has extensive experience in the areas of intellectual property, mergers and acquisitions, and general counsel practices. Learn more about Nemphos Brow at nemphosbrow.com. I'm really excited about today's podcast, which deals with the concept of telemedicine. So important right now as the world deals with the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Now more than ever, telemedicine, a much needed solution for patients to receive health care from their health providers. And joining me for this discussion is the Senior Vice President at LifeBridge Health, Dr. Jonathan Ringo. And you should also know that Dr. Ringo will be leaving his position as of June 1 to become the CEO of a startup, Verapo, a, a specializing in telemedicine. And we'll cover that a little bit later in the interview. And Dr. Ringo, first, welcome in. How are you on this beautiful day? Good afternoon. Great to be here. Thanks very much, Gary. Looking forward to the discussion. So let's give our viewers a little background, Dr. Ringo, on yourself. And let's start with the reason why you even became a physician in the first place. Sure. Well, that actually goes back quite a ways to when I was six years old, living in Johannesburg, South Africa, and was diagnosed at that time with leukemia. I was diagnosed with acute myelogenous leukemia, which um, was, you know, very rare and also had a very pro prognosis um, during the late 70s and early 1980s. Was fortunate enough to be taken to the Dana-Farber Cancer Center in Boston, Massachusetts, where I was started on an experimental protocol and after a number of years of chemotherapy have been in remission for uh, over 40 years. So is it fair to say then that you bring a patient's perspective to your practice? Absolutely. You know, always remember what it's like to be on the other side of the bed, so to speak, uh, remembering all the amazing things that the physicians and nurses that I was fortunate to have care for me did and bring some of them into every one of my interactions with my patients. How long were you in and out of hospitals, by the way, when you first discovered, you know, when it was first discovered that you had this? Sure. So it was approximately three years on and off. Um, I'd you know go in for a cycle of chemotherapy, chemotherapy, um, leave, typically have some side effect within a few days, come back to the hospital for a week or two, recover, and then start the whole thing over again. And as you mentioned, you got this treatment in in the in the United States. But when did you come back to the United States for good to start your career, basically? So I came um, in the late 1980s when I started uh, college uh, and then stayed. Uh, I was at my undergraduate at Brandeis University in uh, Boston, then worked for a biotech company, then uh, started medical school. And then I was fortunate enough to do my residency here at Sinai Hospital in Baltimore mm -hmm. um, in OB, uh, obstetrics and gynecology. And so have been um, very you know, long time involved with Sinai Hospital. And so after your school years in Boston, as you mentioned, and then working in New York, you did end up in Baltimore. You've been now with LifeBridge Health for 10 years. Describe your tenure at LifeBridge Health and some of the accomplishments, perhaps, that you're most proud of. Sure. Well, my first round at LifeBridge Health, as I said, was as a resident. Then I left LifeBridge to work in New York for Northwell Health, then came back here um, almost five years ago, initially as the system's first chief medical information officer, then as vice president, then president of Sinai Hospital, and now during my transition as senior vice president for LifeBridge Health. It's been an incredible organization to work for, one that does a lot of wonderful things for the community, um, but one that's also on the cutting edge of innovation and the marriage of technology and medicine, which is where my passion lies. During yeah. my time here, we've been um, fortunate enough to build what we call a virtual hospital, so um, that was the beginning of uh, a lot of the foray into telemedicine, as well as establishing telemedicine centers in the Philippines and in Israel that help guide a lot of the work that happens here from a um, telemedicine perspective. 
And, and Dr. Ringo, before we move on to the telemedicine concept uh, for the rest of the interview, uh, just right now, what's happening with the, with the health industry, you know, with COVID-19, just describe from your perspective, because you're really there on the front lines in the hospital, some of the challenges that our health, uh, that our hospitals are facing right now. I think those are numerous, you know, at the beginning of the crisis, it was a lack of real understanding of the disease progression, what it really meant for patients, what resources would be needed. As we began to understand more, it was making sure that we had the appropriate medication for patients, that we had the appropriate uh, personal protective equipment, ventilators, et cetera. Um, I think we've been very fortunate here in Baltimore and in Maryland, for the most part, to have the requisite um, needs to take care of our patients. Uh, you know, additionally, patients who came in for treatment were often much sicker and required much longer stays in the intensive care unit than a typical viral pneumonia that you'd expect. So that was a drain on the system. We also had to be careful about uh, procedures that normally would be done without thinking about it. But now because of the danger of spread, having to make sure that those were done in a far more controlled manner. Also in terms of education of our um, team members that work here, making sure that they had what they needed and also when they left the hospital. Um, that, that they had what they needed. You know, as an ex I mean, a small example, but we opened up like a mini supermarket in our cafeterias where employees mm -hmm. could get bread and milk and things. So after a long shift, they have it and before they would go home. Typically, that's not something a hospital would ever have to think about. Right. But in this new day and age, it's, it's some of the things that we have to think about. And how quickly, and who knows when this will finish, really, but how quickly will hospitals be able to return to normal? And what does actually normal perhaps look like in the near future? Well, I think, you know, there's a big challenge because one of the things we don't want to happen, which seems like unfortunately has happened to a certain extent, is people who don't have coronavirus but may have diabetes or, you know, strokes or other things are reluctant to come to the hospital and then their disease gets far worse than if they would get appropriate care. So I think number one, it's very important for everyone to realize that if you need medical care, you should get in touch with your physician and if needed, come to the hospitals. All the emergency rooms are taking every single possible precaution to make sure that individuals who don't have coronavirus are protected from infection so that they can get the care that they need in a safe way. And I think that leads to the second part of your question, that as we move from the initial phases of dealing with coronavirus, we're making sure that all of the healthcare facilities, wherever possible, are taking every precaution so that patients are able to come get the necessary care. And it's even for routine standard annual visits, wellness checks, those kind of things that when patients come, they can do it in a safe and secure environment, but still getting the care that they need. We're talking with Dr. Jonathan Ringo, a senior vice president at LifeBridge Health, and a reminder that our JBiz Health Innovation Series is brought to you by Nemphos Brow, the Mid-Atlantic's leading boutique corporate law firm, supporting corporate growth at every stage of business. Nemphos Brow specializes in corporate, business, startup, and entrepreneurial law, and its team has extensive experience in the areas of intellectual property, mergers and acquisitions, and general counsel practices. And you can learn more about Nemphos Brow at nemphosbrow.com. Well, you've got some exciting things happening in the near future for you. As I mentioned, earlier, you're about to become the um, CEO of, of Verapo, spelled V-E-R-A-P-P-O. It's a telemedicine startup. How appropriate right now. Tell us a little bit about this new venture for you. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, as we were discussing earlier, one of the things that I began to see very clearly over the last few years is that telemedicine was going to play an increasingly important role in the lives of our patients. Most of us are used to, for an example, travel or deal with a bank, we can do it from the touch you know, of an app on our phone and are able to do things remotely. And so this needed to come to medicine as well. And if we see what's happened during the coronavirus that has been borne out, um, the technology that supports telehealth and telemedicine allows physicians and patients to interact from a distance, now in a safer way for both parties because um, they're obviously you know, in the comfort of their home or from a secure area in a hospital or at home. But as technology has developed, there are more and more diagnostic modalities available to clinicians so they can provide more and more of that care remotely. Um, and so my idea was to start this company to leverage remote care, but then as an added twist is also um, utilize a lot of the cutting edge technologies that are being developed in Israel and bring that to the American market as well. Why, why specifically in Israel? 
Are, are they ahead of other countries? How do they compare with the United States? So I think in, if you look at the degree of innovation and the degree of rapid advancement of technology, they really are a world leader in that space. They um, have a great draft pick of new software engineers coming out of some of the units of the army every year. They live in a very challenging environment, have had to come up with some unique ways of dealing with those challenges. And that ingenuity, that perseverance, that innovation that's in the Israeli DNA um, has permeated into the technology space. And they have some really interesting ideas and technologies that we hope to incorporate into our platform and bring to the United States. How, how did you come up with the company name? So the Hebrew word for um, healing is virapo, and he will heal. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a verse in the Bible that describes how when um, someone is injured, the injuring party has to help him get healed. And the verse says, virapo yurape, he will make sure that he gets healed. So that was the inspiration for the name. Very good. So you're starting this position June 1st, I believe, but you've already made, I mean, you, this is already well underway. Can you just talk a little bit about what you've been able to do so far and how far along you are with the company? Sure, it's actually July 1st, but yes, it's oh, um, July 1st. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so, you know, we, we've been talking um, not only in, in Israel with some potential technology partners, but also looking, there are a number of expatriate U.S. nurses and physicians who are based in Israel who are very interested in continuing to work in their chosen field in the United States. Um, additionally, there are a number of fields, for example, nurse practitioners or physician assistants, where that construct of a career does not yet exist in Israel. So, so those folks who've made Aliyah will now have an opportunity to continue work in the U.S., so talking with them, as well as talking with some potential customers as well, who want to be the launch customers when uh, when we start when we start operations. From a medical perspective, when is telemedicine good to use, and when does it? When would you have to go to see your doctor? Sure. So obviously, any time that you're going to be needing definitive surgical intervention. So if you need a, you have a, you know, you have a cut that needs stitches. If you you have something that needs urgent clinical intervention, that's the time to go see your physician. But if it's something that can easily be handled without the direct touch of a clinician, for example, you know, you've got a sore throat, you're not feeling well, you have an unusual rash, you have a fever, you're not sure what's happening. Those kind of things where physician where a physician can make that initial um, interaction assessment and then help you get definitive treatment would be the ideal uh, circumstances. So Dr. Ringo, it seems to me as if you're going from being a doctor to being an entrepreneur. Not that you're foregoing medicine, obviously this is the field, but it's quite a challenge I'm sure, number one. Number two, can you describe it and how you feel about it? It is, but you know, I still view this as being a doctor. It's just an extension of it. It's instead of just taking care of one patient at a time, it's helping to take take care of many patients at a time. Um, and then as a side, I hope to continue still seeing patients, you know, non virtually in the physical world as well, keeping some of those skills up because it's something that I love doing and it informs what I do for the rest of the side. But you're right, being an entrepreneur from a, from that perspective is a little different. I've had phenomenal experience here at LifeBridge and, you know, within Sinai Hospital, learning um, from some of the colleagues that I have here, aspects of running a business. Um, so, so that I'm, I'm sure and hopeful will stand me in good stead. There are a lot of things that, you know, when you work for a large organization, get done or taken care of by others that I'm now going to have to start doing for myself from a small startup. So that's going to be a, a bit of a change, but one that I'm looking forward to attacking. Um, but on the whole, it's, it's something I'm very excited um, and, and looking forward to the opportunity. Very good. And actually, it's interesting you say that about, about LifeBridge and Sinai because they have a great reputation, obviously. But one of the uh, parts of that great reputation is they are known as an entrepreneurial hospital. They've got uh, urgent care centers. They have ambulances, et cetera. So this is probably a good teaching ground for you in terms of that. Absolutely. It, it has been a great learning environment. And as you said, one of the things that, that has been great about working here is when the new and innovative ideas, LifeBridge was at the forefront of bringing those to healthcare in Maryland, for sure. Um, doctor, with this transcontinental connection here, Israel, the United States, et cetera, will you still be able to live in Baltimore? And how do you, feel? I'm sure you have to travel. So how are you going to adjust to that? 
So a couple of things. Firstly, I think in the initial stages, travel may be a bit of a challenge, as we've all seen. You know, um, a, we're going to wait and see what kind of travel is going to be available between the United States and Israel, what airlines are going to look like, how that's all going to pan out. So we'll be watching that very closely. But again, as people become more facile and used to Zoom meetings and virtual conference calls, I think some of those meetings may not be necessary that prior to COVID may have been people have just become far more used to being able to conduct business you know, over a Zoom conference or over a teleconference. Uh, in terms of living, we're fortunate enough, to live in, fortunate enough to live in a wonderful community in Pikesville. You know, we live on the campus of Nair Israel um, and, and are very happy there. But it is, of course, our dream at some point to be able to move to Israel. So as this business progresses and as the opportunity arises, we're hopeful that we may be able to take the leap and, and move with our family to Israel. Well, perhaps Vishana Habaa be Yerushalayim, right? Um, back to the telemedicine real quick, the insurance industry and telemedicine. What's the relationship there right now and how do you see it in the future? Sure. So I think prior to COVID, there were a number of um, telemedicine visits that were approved both by the government payers, the CMS for Medicare and Medicaid and the private insurance companies. As COVID came into force, CMS relaxed a lot of their regulations and started reimbursing a lot of visits um, virtually the same way that they uh, reimbursed those visits non-virtually. In the private insurance company, more and more of them are doing the same. So I see moving forward as the technology continues to advance and as insurance companies see and understand the benefits very clearly, there will definitely be more and more reimbursement of uh, traditionally non-reimbursed telemedicine activities because there's a lot of advantages to them. And you know, one of the things that we're hopeful to show along with others in the telemedicine space is often telemedicine can in fact be more cost effective mm -hmm. because if you can deal with a patient at home, deal with them quickly, get definitive treatment to them, you can prevent escalation and prevent them having to go to a more expensive side of care. You know, uh, Dr. Ringo, an important part of a doctor's repertoire is his bedside, his or her bedside manner, how they handle their patients, etc., emotionally, physically. How does that translate to telemedicine? Are there skills that may need to be learned or acquired or refined because of the physical distance between the patient and the doctor? Absolutely. You know, there's what we always call the art of medicine or that bedside manner is something that is, we always try to teach because empathy is so important in understanding what a patient is going through. The advantage of telemedicine is you can actually still see the patient. So a lot of the facial cues and the you know, body language, you may not see the whole body, so there may be some things that get held back. But on the whole, looking at the face and understanding and gaining the empathy in that two-way conversation where you have the visual aids as well is very important. But I do see down the road something that we've had some discussions about and others as well, that there'll be more specific educational opportunities for physicians and other caregivers specifically around telemedicine. Well, Dr. Ringo, we're about out of time, but before we go, I just wanted to say, uh, being in the Baltimore Jewish community here, how lucky we were to have you for these years, and uh, we wish you the best in all your future endeavors, and don't forget about us back here. <laughs> I certainly will. Thank you so much. From, from my perspective, it's been a privilege to be part of this community. And thank you so much for the time today. Absolutely. That is Dr. Jonathan Ringo, Senior Vice President at LifeBridge. He'll be leaving the position as of July 1st, a new startup, a telemedicine startup called Verapo, V-E-R-A-P-P-O. And of course, we wish him the best. That'll do it for today. I'm your host, Gary Stein. Stay safe, be well, and we'll meet again shortly for another in our in another installment of Jay Moore's JBiz Innovations in Health series, which is sponsored by our good friends at Nemphos Brow. Until next time, thank you so much. Bye bye. Dr. Ringo, it really was a pleasure, and I know we.